Today we're getting creative with conservation, so stick around. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. In today's show, we're going to focus on conservation. Now, I know that may not sound like a very exciting topic, but think about it this way. It's all about making the most of what we have and taking care of it, all in harmony with Mother Nature. In fact, coming up with good gardening practices, such as gardening organically, can help us produce more delicious food that's safer to eat. And when you come up with conservation rules, you can make your little piece of paradise even better for the future. And when it comes to water, don't forget there are ways to save thousands of gallons of water over the course of the growing season. And I'll share those tips with you a little later in the show. We'll also visit the Nature Conservancy, where they're making sure some of our forest friends like these and the plants they live with will have a home for years to come. I'll also show you a great way to add colorful creations to the dishes you cook at home with fresh herbs. Plus tell you about the importance of buying them locally. And here's something you're sure to be buzzing about after you see it. So stick around as we explore ways to help keep the environment as green as our gardens. Welcome back. You know, land conservation is such an important part of preserving our nation's natural resources and natural environment, as well as the plants and animals that are indigenous to this nation. You know, without a home, we can't expect these species to survive. That's why the Nature Conservancy has made, well, conservation their top priority. We recently took a look at a preserve site where both economic and environmental incentives are in place for preserving the land. Mike Fuhrer and David Snowden Jr. tell us more. The Nature Conservancy is a, a nonprofit conservation organization. Um, we work uh, internationally, and our mission is really to preserve plants, animals, and uh, the habitats that they require to survive. Conservation easement is a real unique way for uh, a conservation organization like the Nature Conservancy and a private landowner to work together to do some long-term conservation. And what it is, it's a legal document that's attached to the deed to a piece of property like this that uh, basically outlines what a landowner uh, can and cannot do on his property. And typically, it, it can include things like uh, no timber harvest, uh, no subdividing of the property, no uh, clear cutting, things along those lines. But the interesting part about conservation easements is that every easement document is different. And that means that we go in and, and work with an interested landowner and we tailor the document to the landowner's long-term conservation needs, as well as the Nature Conservancy's long-term needs. Uh, we've worked here with uh, the Snowden family to uh, put together a conservation easement on their 1,100 acres here uh, along Biomeda. Uh, it's a, a good quality bayou uh, here in the Arkansas River Delta. Uh, it's one of the few large uh, wooded tracks in the area, and, and that's really important because uh, Large wooded tracks like this are key to migratory waterfowl as well as migratory songbirds. So uh, because so much of the delta has been cleared, uh, these types of tracks are very, very important. Uh, this particular piece of property is a, a family uh, hunting club, recreation. Uh, we hunt, we fish, we spend time down here all year long. Uh, we enjoy working the land. Our family has had this club for over 50 years, and we wanted to be sure that this land stayed intact forever. One of the things that I'd like to point out on conservation easements that seems to be somewhat confusing to people that are learning about them is they feel like it is a government program, that it opens the land up to the federal government or it opens the land up to the public for public use, and that's a misnomer. 
in a conservation easement, the, the owner continues to own and use the land uh, as he would like. So it's really whatever the individual wants to give up is uh, what's enforced in the easement. It's a wonderful vehicle for people that want to own the land in the future and have no desire to sell it and want to be sure that the land is utilized in the way in which they want to see it utilized from now on. You know, it's really inspiring to me to learn about all of these programs the Nature Conservancy is involved with. Now, coming up next, we're going to visit a restaurant where a chef is dishing up a colorful meal and accenting it with some aromatic herbs. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome back. Now, today we're focusing on conservation. And, you know, even the smallest things can make a big difference, like growing or buying herbs. If you grow your own organically or buy locally grown organic herbs, you certainly help promote a healthier environment. Also, when you think about it, organically grown products are those grown without chemical pesticides or fertilizers, which helps improve the quality of our water. And by buying locally grown herbs, you preserve family farms. And since they're not being transported long distances, there's a reduction in the use of fossil fuels. So to find out some creative ways to use fresh herbs, we headed out to Trio's Grill. There we spoke with Chef Matt Johnson, who showed us how to add some color to a delicious meal. A lot of times, the garnishes that I use depend on what's already in the dish, the flavors that are in the dish, to pair it with that. And then other times, uh, it's mainly for aesthetics more than anything else. As far as the beef dish that I have here, it's, a, it's got a blackberry demi-glaze with it. Uh, there's thyme in the sauce, so obviously I use thyme in, as a, to garnish it as well. It looks really pretty, matches really well with the flavors of the uh, blackberries and the flavor of the grilled meat. A lot of times with fish, I use uh, garlic chives. I pick these up at a local store. And this is one of the things that I use mainly for aesthetic purposes. I don't use it, I don't really get any flavor out of the dish from it. It's just, it just gives a nice high, uh, things of that nature. The salad uh, is composed of uh, local berries. We get from local growers, beautiful blackberries, raspberries, uh, strawberries, all grown locally. Uh, the greens are also from a local farmer. We're very, very proud of those. I get them uh, the day after they've been picked. Edible flowers, which I use those as, as often as possible. Uh, some chrysanthemums, marigolds, nasturtiums, things of that nature, we use quite a bit. I use fresh herbs in every dish that I make, whether it be sauces, finishing off a sauce, finishing off a soup, just to garnish with, uh, flavors and sauces and things like that. Just, they're so easy to grow, and it's just, you're, I think you're kind of neglecting yourself if you just don't use those available options if you can have them. Now those were some great looking garnishes. One I enjoy using is lavender. I love its subtle color and incredible aroma. Of course, lavender's been around for centuries. In a garden I designed, the homeowners wanted a French country look. So that meant getting the soil just right so that lavender would grow along the front walkway. The lavender we've used here is Spanish lavender. Now, Spanish lavender is characterized by having very distinct flowers. If you look closely at them, the blooms look like they have rabbit ears. Now, all lavenders are Mediterranean herbs that enjoy well-drained soils and dry arid conditions, which means they don't always grow well in the heavy clay soils of the south. But in order to create this amazing display, we took great pains to make sure that these beds were well drained and suitable for growing lavender. Well, are you still wondering what the buzz is all about? Well, I'll tell you right after the break, so stay with us. Okay, you may be wondering what honeybees have to do with this show on conservation. Well, actually, there are two very good reasons. The first is that honeybees are such important pollinators. You see, these little creatures are responsible for increasing the yield of fruit and vegetables on our farms, in our gardens, and in the wild. And the other reason, sadly, is that the honeybees themselves are in need of conservation. Now, I've been keeping bees for years, and it's a hobby that really fascinates me. I've met many friends through beekeeping, including Ed Levi. Now, Ed is one of those guys that I would consider an expert beekeeper. So with the honeybee basically being an immigrant from the 1600s, what was the pollinator or the principal pollinators in this country before the honeybee? Well, first of all, Alan, you need to realize that there wasn't as, need, as much need for pollination back then because we didn't do agriculture the way we do it now. Agriculture was very small in little plots. Uh, pollination generally is done by a bunch of different means. Wind is a very good pollinator. 
birds are good pollinators and other bugs are good pollinators. Even bats. Even bats are good pollinators. But as agriculture got bigger and bigger, we needed more organized pollination. And honeybees are the best pollinators that we know. And we can take hives and move them to a crop. And when somebody grows thousands of acres of almonds or thousands of acres of alfalfa or cucumbers, they can hire a beekeeper to come in with their hives and contract with him to bring the bees in for pollination. And something else that's real important to understand in all that is that as agriculture evolved, pesticides became more and more common. And the pesticides wiped out a lot of the natural pollinators. And the beekeeper can protect his hives the best he can from those pesticides and then still have a lot of good pollinators available. But the pollination crop, uh, the agricultural crop that is improved or made possible is worth about 10 to 15 billion dollars a year. That's a billion with a B. Billion with a B, about 50 times the value of the honey that's produced. Amazing. How far will they fly, Ed, to, to, to bring back nectar or pollen? Uh, generally speaking, honeybees will fly three miles is what the books say. They actually took some bees in a boat out on one of the Great Lakes up in the north and slowly moved away from shore when there was a lot of flowers on shore and they got five miles from shore before the bees stopped bringing back nectar. Five miles. Yes. Now there's been a lot of research recently about the dances of bees mm -hmm. and they're just beginning to unlock some of that mystery. As far as the main dance that we know is called the wagtail dance and it actually communicates to the other bees where a resource is relative to the position of the sun in relation to where the hive is sitting. So they'll do their dance, uh, for example, if the sun was straight, straight behind the hive and the resource or the flower was in front of the hive, they would do a dance that would go downward on the, on the vertical plane of the comb to say that it's in the opposite direction of the sun. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. Thanks to the work of beekeepers like Ed, our honeybees will be around for a long time helping our garden stay both beautiful and bountiful. Today, I have a letter from Manhattan, Kansas that I'd like to share with you. The viewer writes, a few days ago, you talked about the control of bagworms, which can be a problem. And you used an interesting spray to control them. What is that spray? Well, the spray I like to use is organic. It's a natural control called Bacillus thuringiensis. It's actually a bacterium, and you can find it in most garden centers. The active ingredient in Bt is actually a toxin. This is what kills the caterpillars, and you don't have to worry because it won't harm other beneficial insects in the garden, such as honeybees or earthworms. It's best to spray as soon as you see or suspect any damage, and it may require several applications before you get them under control. Now the main thing to remember about this pest is that it's the caterpillar that does all the damage in the spring. And one of the best ways I've found to deal with these little devils is to hit them during this stage of their life cycle when they're the most vulnerable. For more environmentally friendly ways to deal with pests in the garden, just log on to my website, pallensmith.com. We all know that one of the most essential elements in a garden is water, and we should do everything we can to try to conserve it. Now there's some simple things that you can do around the house that can help cut down on the demand for water. First, don't leave the hose running when you're washing your car. Use a bucket and then give it a quick rinse with the hose at the end. Also try using a broom instead of a hose to clean sidewalks and driveways. Both of these more conservative approaches can save up to 150 gallons each time. Next, think about capturing tap water. Now what I mean is while you wait for hot water to come down the pipes, catch the flow in a watering can to use later on house plants or your garden. And of course, don't water the sidewalks or driveway or gutter. Adjust your sprinkler so that it lands on your lawn or your garden where it belongs. Or use a soaker hose instead of a sprinkler. Now one last tip, don't forget about plants. You know, some plants are more drought tolerant than others and require less water. For instance, these Japanese procumbens juniper are wonderful for planting in full hot sun it has hot western exposure. Now you thought we were finished talking about honeybees. Well, we haven't. We've got to talk about one of the best things about honeybees, and that's honey. 
When we come back, I'll show you a recipe for a salad dressing that I whipped up using this wonderful fresh from the garden treat. So don't go away. I'm always looking for any recipe that's simple to prepare and full of flavor. And it's great when it makes the most of what the season has to offer in the way of vegetables, produce, or even honey. I'm preparing a delicious recipe for yogurt honey poppy seed dressing for fresh fruit salad using honey from my beehives. It's one of nature's healthiest treats. And with the honey harvest finished, I have plenty of it on hand. I start with one eight ounce carton of plain yogurt and add one fourth of a cup of honey. To this I add about a tablespoon and a half of fresh lemon juice and then a teaspoon of poppy seed and blend it all together. Now I'll chill this dressing in the refrigerator for about an hour along with the fresh fruit. I think this dressing is especially good on fresh pears as well as citrus like grapefruit and oranges and it's a great way to take advantage of end of the season melons like honeydew and cantaloupe. If you reach into your cupboard and find that your honey has turned to sugar or crystallized like this, don't throw it away, it's still fine. All you have to do is put it in hot water, still in the jar, and in just a few minutes, the crystals will dissolve and it will be back in liquid form. This year, my bees worked extra hard producing a dark colored, rich flavored honey that I try to use every way I can. When you combine it with yogurt and fresh fruit, it creates a flavor that's almost too good to be true. A great companion to P. Allen Smith Gardens is our website, pallensmith.com. Log on to learn more about today's topic. You'll also get hands-on gardening tips, design ideas, lessons in garden history, delicious recipes, and crafts projects that will take you from season to season, all beautifully illustrated with thousands of colorful images that will inspire your creativity. Plus, don't miss Allen's free weekly newsletter delivered straight to your inbox, all just a mouse click away at pallensmith.com. That honey poppy seed dressing is so simple to make and so tasty, I hope you'll give it a try. Now that's it for today's show. You know, we learned so much about conservation and picked up some great tips on ways to reduce the amount of water we use. And if you're interested in preserving land like David Snowden, you might want to get in touch with the Nature Conservancy. We also got some great ideas from Chef Matt Johnson at Trio's Grill on how to use fresh locally grown herbs to help spruce up a dining experience. And of course, we can't forget about the bees. They just work so hard to keep our gardens green and our taste buds happy with their delicious honey. Now, if you missed anything from today's show or you'd like a copy of that recipe, check out my website. That's pallensmith.com. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. garden I dream of a bed of flowers bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us and every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile oh But smile